All right, today I want to go over an interesting case with you guys that I saw a few months ago. And really the purpose of this video is to demonstrate how medicine can be very interesting at times and very unexpected and you never know what you're going to get in medicine. So let's just get straight into it. Uh, disclaimer, some aspects of the history and other patient details have been modified to maintain patient privacy. So I was called for admission for this patient for left lower extremity cellulitis and hypoxemia to the mid 80s on room air in the ED. Basically, the story was this is a 77 year old woman with end-stage renal disease heart failure COPD and pulmonary hypertension who came in with left lower extremity redness and swelling for the past three days their primary care physician prescribed Keflex for the cellulitis but she didn't get any improvement so she went to the emergency department where she was given a dose of clindamycin while she was sitting there in the ED, she was found to be satting in the mid 80s and was given duonebs and six liters of oxygen. Of note, she doesn't use any oxygen at home and she says she normally sats in the 80s and she has had no breathing symptoms throughout. But basically because of this new oxygen requirement, that's kind of a uh, indication for admission. So I went to go see her. And so when I got to her room, basically I took a look at her leg and you can see on the left leg, there's definitely some swelling, erythema, and it was warm. So very consistent with cellulitis. But what I really noticed and was very interested by was when I went to go listen to her lungs, this is what I saw. And it was pretty impressive of a rash. So I decided to take a picture of it. And you can no also note that it was kind of scattered all throughout her upper extremities um, and really had this kind of scabbed over appearance. Uh, it was just a very interesting rash. And she said that this has been going on for over a year now. It's intensely itchy and she scratches it a lot. And so this really kind of piqued my curiosity when I was seeing her. So in terms of her past medical history, she has ESRD, heart failure, hypertension, COPD, and pulmonary hypertension, no past surgical history, uh, no significant allergies, and medications, really a pretty benign medication list. She's on a phosphate binder, amlodipine, metoprolol, resuvastatin, and uh, an inhaler for her COPD. No significant family history. In terms of her social history, she lives in a home by herself with five cats. Her sister lives nearby, and she smokes half a pack per day, but otherwise, nothing too notable on her social history. Objective findings, she was afebrile, blood pressure was normal, 112 over 64, heart rate 85, and she was satting 97%. So initially she was in the ED satting 87%, and so that's why they decided to put on six liters of nasal cannula to get her up to 97%. She was a very pleasant elderly woman with a regularly irregular heart rate, no murmurs. She had diminished breath sounds bilaterally with occasional and expiratory wheezing. And then her extremities basically just showed some mild edema and the basically findings consistent with cellular with some warmth and erythema. And then the upper back had those multiple round scabbed over lesions with a little bit of mild surrounding erythema. Now moving on to her lab workup. So you can see she's got a bit of a leukocytosis, white count of 14. She has a chronic anemia. This is pretty stable for her. And platelets are 260. Her BMP and her LFT is all pretty much normal. She's on dialysis, so this creatinine is just kind of fluctuating. BNP is definitely up, it's 39,000, and her VBG was normal. But one thing that was really notable for me was because she had this rash, I decided you know, to look over here. Sometimes you can kind of glance over this section because uh, most of the time we don't really look at it that closely. Uh, but if you notice here, her eosinophils were 3,400, and that is very high, and so that was very notable. Here's her chest x-ray. You can see that it's kind of hazy throughout, uh, consistent with moderate pulmonary edema. She's got some blunting of the costophrenic angles, so there's some trace to small pleural effusions. And then she's kind of got this stable cardiomegaly. Another thing you can note is that she's got pretty uh, prominent hyalur vessels. So this could be from the volume overload, but also she's got a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And so a lot of times you can see uh, thickening of the pulmonary artery. You can even see that on uh, x-ray as you do here. So in terms of the plan for her, um, you know, she's really got a couple of things. So she initially came in for this acute on chronic hypoxemic respiratory failure, as well as this left lower extremity cellulitis. So basically, it was pretty simple in terms of these two workups. The uh, respiratory failure was secondary to some volume overload. She did have uh, dialysis recently, but it was cut a couple hours short because she was having an issue with her fistula. And then maybe there was some component of progression of her COPD or pulmonary hypertension. So our goal basically was to admit her, set her up with home oxygen, do a dialysis session, continue her lama and laba inhaler, and then consider initiation of inhaled corticosteroids, 
given elevated eosinophils greater than 300, which is an indication for that, and then follow-up in pulmonary hypertension clinic. For her left lower extremity cellulitis, she failed Keflex outpatient, so we basically broadened her to doxycycline to kind of gain some MRSA coverage. But really what was interesting to me was her hyper eosinophilia and the numerous skin lesions. And so this is something that was completely unexpected when I went to go down and see her. But with medicine in general, you can often be surprised when you go down and see the patient yourself. So let's talk about hyper eosinophilia. So eosinophilia is defined by greater than 500 eosinophils and hyper eosinophilia is greater than 1500 eosinophils. And then once you develop organ dysfunction and eosinophils greater than 1500, then that's actually called hyper eosinophilic syndrome. And here I just kind of pulled up a flow sheet of her labs and you can see the eosinophils, she basically had zero eosinophils the whole time until all of a sudden in 2022, she went up to 7,000 eosinophils. And then by the time we saw her was down to like 3,400, 3,100, which is still significantly elevated. The next question I asked is who needs to be admitted? Cause I'm on my screening hospitalist rotation right now. And so it's always a good question to ask, you know, what kind of patients do we need to admit? Say she just came in with cellulitis alone and had this eosinophil count of 7,000 or 3,400. At what point does a patient need to be admitted? So this is from up to date. So if a patient is acutely ill or has extremely high eosinophil count, such as greater than 50,000, you know, this is a clear cut admission. This is because there'd be very high concern for some kind of uh, hematologic malignancy or leukemia causing this. But for asymptomatic patients with hyper eosinophilia, up to date basically says that patients with eosinophil counts greater than 5,000 or rapidly rising eosinophil counts should be evaluated promptly. So they don't really give any strict guidelines for who should be admitted. But I would say that anybody with uh, eosinophil count over 5,000 that's not explained probably should be admitted for an expedited workup. Now, in terms of the differential for hyper eosinophilia, we have all of these different diseases here. And so this was something that I was kind of considering overnight, you know, if the patient could have any of these diseases. And so let's just go down the list kind of. So starting off, we have asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis. The thing with these ones is that they're not really going to cause a hyper eosinophilia to 7,000 or 5,000. Usually it's going to be in the upper hundreds, maybe lower thousands. So very not, you know, not really likely for her. The next one is going to be drug hypersensitivity, in particular, DRESS syndrome. And I think whenever you hear about eosinophils and a rash, we always think about DRESS syndrome on our differential. So let's take a look if DRESS syndrome could, could be a reasonable cause for her. So DRESS syndrome typically has a rash that looks like this. So it doesn't look quite consistent with her rash. And usually it's going to be described as a maculopapular eruption that progresses into a coalescing erythema. Often there's uh, more systemic symptoms such as fever, lymphadenopathy, and visceral involvement and liver injury in 90% of cases, which this patient did not have. And finally, the last key point here is that there's usually a history of exposure to high risk drugs. And typically this is gonna be your anti-epileptics are gonna be huge offenders in this category, uh, some of the antibiotics, but she really didn't have any history to suggest any new drug initiation. And the rash again, didn't look very characteristic. So dress syndrome seemed a little bit less likely. So the next big bucket is kind of infectious diseases. And what you'll see here is kind of a lot of the parasitic infections, as well as fungi and a lot of the pulmonary infections like coccidiomycosis, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, and histoplasmosis. And really this all kind of falls into the big bucket of pulmonary eosinophilia. So let's talk about pulmonary eosinophilia really quickly. This is uh, defined when you have some of these findings. So greater than 500 peripheral eosinophils, imaging findings of pulmonary parenchymal disease, lung tissue eosinophilia on biopsy, or greater than 10% of eosinophils on BAL. So I think for this patient, you know, pulmonary eosinophilia was definitely on the differential because she had a pretty significant respiratory history with her COPD and pulmonary hypertension and kind of this worsening hypoxemia. So in terms of just the differential of pulmonary eosinophilia, you start off with your helminthic infections, uh, most notably uh, strongyloides, and this causes Loeffler syndrome. You've got non-helminthic infections like Coxy, TB, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, toxins and medications, which I have seen. We actually saw a patient at the VA who had uh, pulmonary eosinophilia from phenytoin, one of the anti-epileptics. And then you've got idiopathic acute eosinophilic pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and EGPA or Churg-Strauss syndrome. And so one of the key points here is that a lot of these um, conditions, you would actually use steroids to kind of calm down the eosinophilia and improve their symptoms, but you always, always need to rule the patient out for strongyloides 
allergies because if they have a strong allergies infection and you give them steroids, this can lead to a disseminated strong allergies infection that can be very, very fatal. And so this is why we basically always send a strong allergies test before we start any of these patients on steroids. So in this patient, we sent aspergillus, which was negative, coxy, which was negative, and then we also sent strong allergies, which was negative as well. Now let's look a little bit more into ABPA. So this is usually characterized by asthma and recurrent exacerbations. And really, it really only occurs in patients with two predisposing conditions, asthma and cystic fibrosis. And so our patient had COPD, she didn't have asthma, so technically she didn't really meet this criteria. But I still wanted to go over the other criteria for ABPA because I thought it was interesting. So there's two obligatory criteria, and then two out of three of the following criteria must be present. So first, she must have IgE levels against aspergillus greater than 0.35. And so for her, you can see that she was 0.75 and 0.48, so she did meet that criteria. And then an elevated total serum IgE concentration greater than 1,000. And you can see her IgE levels were off the charts and greater than 50,000. Then the other two criteria is precipitating antibodies to aspergillus, which she was negative for, radiographic pulmonary opacities consistent with ABPA, which we didn't have, we only had a chest x-ray. So in retrospect, I feel like I should have ordered a CT scan for her to kind of get a better look at her pulmonary parenchyma. And then a total eosinophil count of greater than 500. So you, she, you know, she meets basically all of these criteria. The only one is she doesn't have asthma or cystic fibrosis. So ABPA is a little bit less likely on our differential, but definitely something still that was worth considering considering overnight. All right, and next I want to talk about eGPA or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Churg Strauss syndrome. So this one is defined by asthma as a cardinal feature. Also, patients often have chronic rhinosinusitis. They can have like eczema symptoms as well. And the most common involved organ is the lung and then skin. You can see a peripheral neuropathy in 75% of patients and cardiac involvement uh, suggests a very poor prognosis. Uh, CT scan will, will show ground glass opacities or consolidation and the treatment is steroids or immunosuppressants. And here you could take a look at the rash of Churg-Strauss syndrome. And again, it doesn't really quite look like the rash of our patient. This was definitely something I was considering, however, because I went back through the chart and actually found this note from just a couple weeks before she was admitted. And this is back when the patient was found to have an eosinophil count of 7,000. And so they, they called the patient and patient states, I have allergies plus. I have fruit trees, almond trees, you name it. We have it in this gated community. I am sniffling every morning. So that kind of fits in with the chronic rhinositis picture of this patient. But again, the rash just didn't seem very characteristic of Churg-Strauss syndrome. So now we've kind of ruled out DRESS syndrome and the pulmonary eosinophilia causes and eGPA seem a little bit less likely. The next big bucket we're going to talk about is neoplastic disorders. And here you're going to see primary hyper eosinophilic syndromes, leukemias, or basically T-cell lymphomas. So if you go on up to date, you'll see that they suggest getting a vitamin B12 and tryptase level because these two markers are suggestive of myeloid malignancies. And so we actually did draw some of those while she was admitted. And you can see that her tryptase was elevated at 12.5 and then up to 16.8. And her vitamin B12 was also uh, elevated. So are we kind of going down this malignancy pathway now that we've got some of these results back? So again, you can see multiple different conditions that can cause hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Uh, but primarily it's going to be myeloid hematologic malignancies and T-cell lymphomas. And so uh, just going through this, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is definitely on the differential. And it's really subdivided into two big groups, and that's mycosis fungoides and then Cesare syndrome. But again, if you look at the rash here, none of these really match up with our patient's rash. And then another condition that I was considering overnight is what is another skin condition with elevated tryptase over 20 and a prominent skin rash? And that's going to be systemic mastocytosis. So you can see as it develops, it becomes this very, very diffuse kind of morbilliform rash. And this is because of pathologic mast cells accumulating in tissues. And just a brief discussion on cutaneous mastocytosis versus systemic mastocytosis. So cutaneous mastocytosis is only going to be limited to the skin, whereas in systemic, you're going to have uh, extra cutaneous uh, organ involvement. So going back to the plan for this patient, for her respiratory failure, we already had a plan, cellulitis, we got a plan, but what are we gonna do about this hyper eosinophilia and these numerous skin lesions? Well, if there's any crazy skin rash that you're seeing in the hospital, then you know the next step is to consult derm. And so we obviously consulted derm and they immediately proceeded to take some biopsies of some of these lesions. And then here's what they wrote for their assessment. So they saw excoriations on the back, bilateral upper arms, and bilateral lower legs favor uremic pruritus versus drug-induced pruritus versus xerotic dermatitis, rule out perforating disorder. So this was interesting for me because when we consulted derm, 
we told them about the eosinophilia and then they didn't even really mention it in their note, which I thought was surprising for me because, uh, you know, it seemed kind of like the most interesting part of this patient's rash was the high degree of eosinophilia she had. And they said they favored uremic pruritus because she was a dialysis patient. But if you look at her BUN, her BUN was only 11. That's probably lower than my BUN. So in my opinion, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems less likely that it would be caused by uremia when she has a normal, if not low BUN. The other thing that they did mention is rule out perforating disorder. And so now this is the second time I've actually seen it. I did my nephrology rotation and then also I've seen it in this patient's assessment as well. And this is actually the most common rash that you're going to see in end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis. So what is the most common acquired rash in patients with dialysis? That's actually called acquired perforating dermatosis. And this can be a very pruritic rash that develops in up to 10% of dialysis patients. And you can see it's got this kind of characteristic appearance. It's described as having a central keratotic plug in an umbilicated papule. And this looks pretty similar to our patient's presentation, right? Just for reference, here is her rash. And then this is the rash of acquired perforating dermatosis. And she is a dialysis patient, so this kind of fits. The only thing that isn't quite as uh, fitting is, you know, these patients have much more of that keratotic plug, whereas with our patient, she doesn't have that quite as much. But you can see in some of them, she does have a keratotic plug as well, and she's been scratching them a lot, so maybe that's why we don't really see it as much. But this is definitely something interesting to remember, is that the most common acquired rash in up to 10% of patients on dialysis is going to be this acquired perforating dermatosis. So the biopsy results eventually came back, and it showed ulceration with fibrosis slash granulation tissue and sparse eosinophils. The features are consistent with excoriation slash trauma. As eosinophils are present, a superimposed drug reaction or other hypersensitivity reaction could be considered. Clinical correlation is recommended. So obviously, you know, the biopsy was not super revealing, unfortunately, and so still didn't give us a clear answer of what this rash was. We did get some cultures of those wounds, and it did show that it was growing MRSA. And so that's why I think it was beneficial that we ended up broadening her to doxycycline for MRSA coverage. And she basically had told us that, you know, this actually started off as one of these kind of um, circular rash things, and she started scratching at it. And then that's when her legs started becoming swollen and erythematous and basically developed cellulitis. So unfortunately, patient uh, did not want to stay in the hospital. They felt like their breathing was fine. And so she ended up leaving against medical advice, even though we wanted to continue doing more workup for her. But we did manage to set her up with an allergy clinic visit uh, so that she could undergo further evaluation. And here was her allergy clinic visit. So she was found to have elevated IgE and hyper eosinophilia. Hyper eosinophilic syndrome is defined as hyper eosinophilia with evidence of related end organ da damage. In this patient's case, it is not clear that her heart, lung, and renal disease are related to the hyper eosinophilia or alternative diagnoses. Strongyloides testing was negative. With elevated IgE, tryptase, and vitamin B12, malignancy is a concern. EGPA is also a possibility given her comorbid pulmonary disease. So honestly, this was a great note in my opinion, and I feel like it was really good that we set her up with the allergist because this is a perfect specialist for us to get involved in this case. Overall, would recommend completing workup for her hyper eosinophilia with blood work as below, heme onc referral, and repeat imaging. So these are some of the studies that they ordered, but notably they also put in a heme onc referral because of the high risk that this could be a malignancy. And they ended up sending some of these genetic tests. Uh, they sent this hyper eosinophilia fish screening, which was negative, T-cell clonality screening, which was negative. And then the last note that's in the chart as of now was that patient was called and a message was left to schedule a bone marrow biopsy. And so clearly oncology wants to get a bone marrow biopsy because the um, concern for malignancy is high enough that they would want to just take a sample to see what's going on. So that's basically it for this patient. Um, this is basically uh, a really interesting case. And I really wanted to show you guys it because I felt like it was a really good demonstration, A, uh, of us to review hyper eosinophilia, you know, all of these conditions here, dress syndrome, pulmonary eosinophilia, ABPA, EGPA, acquired perforating dermatosis, and also just hyper eosinophilic syndrome in general. But also, it really goes to show you why, you know, medicine is so interesting and why I love practicing medicine so much, because you never know what you're going to get when you come in and when you go evaluate a patient. You could be completely surprised. And there's so much interesting pathology that could be going on. And I really hope we end up finding the diagnosis for this patient. I'm definitely going to be continuing to follow along to see what they discover. And hopefully there's something that we can treat and make her feel better because this uh, crazy rash she has is definitely pretty debilitating and is affecting her quality of life quite a bit. And so what do you think? Do you think all of this patient's symptoms can be described?
described by Occam's razor and that it's all just due to an underlying hematologic malignancy? Or do you think it's Hickam's dictum where multiple different things are going on and maybe she has acquired perforating dermatosis but also has an underlying hematologic disease or pulmonary eosinophilia on top of that? Let me know down in the comments below what you think this patient has. So anyways, I hope that was an interesting video for you guys as well. A quick review of hybridia an interesting case, and also just a demonstration of why medicine is so cool sometimes. So thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.